the protection of civilians is at the center of the United Nations peace and security agenda. Our peacekeepers and other personnel are increasingly being asked not only to keep armies at bay, but to protect people who are prey to militias and other combatants. We are saying no to impunity and say yes to accountability for those who commit crimes against humanity and other grave violations of human rights. The documentary you are about to see explains the roles and responsibilities of the peacekeepers, humanitarian personnel, human rights experts, and others who bring protection mandates to life in the world's conflict zones. The protection of civilians is crucial to the credibility of the United Nations. The men, women, and children who look to us for help must be able to have confidence in our ability to respond quickly and effectively. We have not always succeeded. The tragedies in Rwanda and Srebrenica are etched forever on our minds. Today, we are determined to use every available tool to protect vulnerable populations. That requires resources, training, and new thinking. And it demands greater support from the Security Council, which formulates protection mandates. I hope this documentary will inspire you to do your part. Making a difference is our collective responsibility. Increasingly, uh, whether it's right or wrong, the world is going to judge the United Nations on its ability to protect civilians. When a peacekeeping mission is deployed and there is trouble, they run. Now, where do they run to? The United Nations compound. Why? Because they expect protection. We're talking about millions of people who live in places in the world who for no uh, sort of fault of their own are somehow caught up. It's about our responsibility to protect those people and at the heart of this are children, women, men, families, communities. There are regimes all over the third world which do not really care about their citizens. They, they do not do enough not just about protecting their basic rights, but even providing basic necessities for their citizens. So, somebody needs to stand up for them. If you're not present, you can't protect. So it's very important that UN uh, peace missions, and in particular peacekeeping, be present. Uh, and above all, to intervene when needed to help protect those who cannot protect themselves. Today it is not sort of two well-trained, well-disciplined, well-equipped armies on a battlefield fighting over territory. That's sort of an, a, a very old image of, of what a, a war is. Today it's often civilian wars in failed states with unruly rebel groups. That means we have to adapt to a new reality. It is a totally new kind of warfare. The primary target of terrorism, for example, are civilians. It's not a strategic path or a strategic strait in an ocean. It is not territory. It is civilians. The requirement for peacekeeping missions to protect civilians was explicitly mandated for the first time as part of a peacekeeping mission in 1999. Since then, the UN Secretariat, troop and police contributing countries, host governments, humanitarian personnel and human rights actors have worked to interpret what this meant in practice. The initial idea of peacekeeping was really not a proactive one. Uh, it was just to be sort of a buffer between parties and to monitor. Earlier, war was between combatants, but now you really find that civilians are often just targets of war. And this has enormous implications because the Geneva Conventions, everything is based on the fact that civilians will be protected. 
And what is happening is that it's falling on the United Nations now more and more. What we saw during this decade of, of the 90s is that the UN was the impotent witness to immense horrors. It almost destroyed the UN because the, the confidence that the people should have in the organization was badly damaged by what we saw when uh, people who had expected the UN to protect them died. The series of tragedies in the 1990s made it clear that the traditional idea of peacekeeping was no longer appropriate. In Rwanda, and again in the Balkans, the United Nations found that there was no peace to keep, no opposing armies to separate, no ceasefire to maintain. There were civilians, and the United Nations, not having planned for them, failed them. The Security Council responded to these failures by placing protection of civilians on its agenda and by explicitly mandating for peacekeeping missions to protect civilians. POC is a very specific task that we received for the first time in 1999 in Sierra Leone. All our peacekeeping operations start with a mandate from the Security Council, and in the mandate, we receive more and more the famous sentence saying, you, the mission, has to protect civilians under imminent threat within its capability and its area of deployment. Those provisions have grown ever stronger in the new missions, including, for example, the one I led in, in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, which put protection of civilians as our first priority. The question, as always, is how to do that. It is the host government that has the primary responsibility to protect its civilian population. Protection of civilians' activities, undertaken by peacekeeping missions, are aimed at creating the conditions which will enable the peacekeepers to leave. We're lucky enough to live in an environment where there is peace, uh, where political rule is not contested, where institutions are functioning. And that is what protects us, fundamentally. Functioning institutions that respond to a legitimate uh, system of government. And that's what we need to understand in situations that are coming out of conflict, that ultimately it is those same outcomes which will allow for sustainable protection of civilians. Building viable and, and stable states for the future and in giving people their dignity and their rights that they so deserve, protection of civilians is at the core of it. It involves very much helping very vulnerable people within the refugee population, particularly women who are at a much higher risk of sexual and gender-based violence. It involves helping children who have been separated from their families, who may be unaccompanied, who have been caught up in a mass exodus situation, fleeing problems in their own country. Whatever you're doing for a particular country is meant for that population, and if you cannot ensure that that population lives in conditions that are human, where they are able to lead normal lives, then I think you're missing the point. And indeed, if you're not protecting the civilians in a conflict zone or a post-conflict environment, why are you there? There is no agreed definition of POC amongst organizations in the sector. For example, humanitarian and international organizations who also do protection work understand POC differently to UN peacekeepers. This means that each protection actor has a responsibility to understand and respect how others contribute to enhancing the protection of civilians. Humanitarians have a fairly well-developed sense of what protection means for them. It's you know, short-term emergency assistance, life-saving assistance. The human rights crowd know what protection means for them. It's investigating abuses, it's documenting crimes, it's seeking justice. Because peacekeepers also require a clear understanding of their roles and responsibilities when it comes to the protection of civilians, an operational concept on POC, based on experience and lessons learned in the field, has been recently developed. 
because ultimately it is these broader systemic institutional and political solutions which will mean that the protection of civilians is sustainable. It will mean that the civilians can look to their own authorities for protection. And that's why I think one, one has to always remember um, when one looks at uh, peacekeeping situations that we can't lose track of the fact that um, a, a longer term sustainable peace uh, needs to be found. And that's why when we talk in peacekeeping about protection of civilians, we talk about it as having these three tiers. One is the protection through political process. Uh, everything that we do is, um, in fact, directly towards having a better political process to make peace more sustainable. And within that, protection is a very important part. So it's the second tier is the, uh, the protection from physical violence. And that actually is just not uh, in a reactive way trying to, to protect, but it means also prevention, uh, it also means deterrence. The third tier is uh, what we call creating or establishing a protective environment. And this goes to you know, capacity building of local forces, such as the, the police force in, in, in the local society. As well as understanding the meaning of POC, it is important to understand the international laws, conventions and treaties and the international political system which give legitimacy to the United Nations peacekeeping operations and protection activities. The legal obligation for the protection of civilians comes from a number of different sources. First, perhaps most obviously, is treaty law international human rights treaties and international humanitarian law treaties, the Geneva Conventions of 1949, additional protocols of 1977, some of the major international human rights law treaties, the Convention Against Torture, the Convention for the Protection of Rights of the Child, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We have to, to distinguish, I would say, on one side, uh, international humanitarian law, which is a, a, a set of, of norms which limit the effects of conflict, uh, first by protecting people who do not take part in fighting and hostilities, and on the other side, which limit the rights of parties to a conflict to use weapons and methods of, of warfare. And finally, there are a lot of norms regarding the protection of ambulances, uh, hospitals, also creating some protected uh, zones so that civilians can stay out of direct uh, dangers. The arrangements with the host government, of course, absolutely paramount and should never be underestimated. It's not as if all of a sudden we've developed a whole lot of new law. I think it's more that the international community has become increasingly prepared to see that obstacles to achieving protection of civilians are as important as perhaps we might have thought they were. We have a Human Rights Council which now has a whole plethora of new mechanisms designed to make it a more effective way of addressing root causes. We have a Security Council which is more and more sensitive to the question of protection of civilians. We have a UN system to address the range of issues that uh, affect civilians in conflict situations. So all of that is a step in the right direction. One of the most significant developments in the last 18 years has been the proliferation of international criminal courts and tribunals which have been set up by the international community to deal with responsibility for egregious violations of human rights and as a consequence of the international community's resolve to try to end impunity for atrocity and to hold people accountable for their violations of international criminal law. We are seeing a greater commitment to enforcement of the body of law that for decades we've said we believed in. The deployment of UN peacekeepers is always a response to a crisis. It is always because something is happening and the international community needs to respond. Peacekeeping missions continue to face significant challenges when it comes to the protection of civilians. 
Reports and lessons learned studies in the last decade identified many gaps throughout the entire process of planning for, deploying and managing a peacekeeping mission. These needed to be addressed. We are deployed in situations where our mandate can be very strongly challenged by forces that from time to time can also challenge the government. This, this is very new in peacekeeping. But what is clear is that we have drawn the line between peacekeeping and peace enforcement. We want to stay in peacekeeping, even though we can have sequences where we are very, very robust. We're not uh, seeing armies uh, fighting each other. We are seeing uh, militias with uh, unclear chains of command, with little accountability. So it's much more complicated than monitoring a ceasefire, let's say, between two armies. Now what it is about is assessing the threat of a militia, sometimes being able to deter that militia, sometimes being able to actually take action against that militia. Who are the civilians? We have different groups of civilians in the theater. We have UN civilian personnel on the ground who need protection. Anybody who is unarmed in a peacekeeping theater could be considered a civilian in danger because he could be victim of, let's say, the armed conflict around him. And the requirements for each group is different. The reason that POC is so challenging is because it's not a task you can just give to one entity and say, go and protect civilians. Because there's so many actors involved in it. The most important actors, by the way, and the ones that are most forgotten in this, are the communities themselves. If communities are not involved, then it doesn't matter what a peacekeeping mission does, they won't be leaving a lasting peace the type of conflict situations that we're going into to protect the civilian population are becoming more extreme. And the traditional concept of a non-partisan, neutral peace support operation, I'm not sure that they hold entirely anymore. The government is an actor in the conflict, and they're the ones guiding, for example, where UN peacekeepers can work. So one of the things that we're always pushing for is that if it's a UN peacekeeping mission, should keep promoting access everywhere and not sit back and allow the government just to dictate. Peacekeepers are faced with increasingly complex operational environments, often with limited resources to carry out their tasks. The unfortunate reality is that peacekeeping operations cannot protect everyone from everything all of the time. There is a need to manage expectations. Just for this small part of the Congo, it means 18 peacekeepers to protect 10,000 people. Despite the fact that there's lots of expectation on your mission, we are not able to protect everyone from everything. It's fair to say that there will never be enough resources. Um, we're deployed in vast areas, um, there are huge population groups, and we will never be able to provide 100% protection. Um, I think what people who are suffering from violence are looking for from the mission is, is hope and the sense that the mission is making a difference. Even if we don't have all the resources that we need, the mission needs to be seen to be doing its utmost. The military, the police, the civilian leadership, to be active, to be putting itself on the line. The discipline of peacekeepers and their respect for the law must be upheld. Failure to do this can seriously impact on the ability of the mission to do its work and of peacekeepers to provide protection. Each contingent of a peace contributing country to a peace mission is bound by its national military law. For the legal obligations prohibiting sexual abuse and exploitation, for example, are a really important part of, of, of this obligation. And it's for troop contributing countries when a member of a national contingent in a peace mission violates legal obligations like that to investigate that alleged violation. Even one case of uh, a peacekeeper uh, abusing uh, a, a woman somewhere um, destroys a lot of the credibility of the whole international community. In their efforts to protect civilians, 
uniformed components of peacekeeping missions perform an important role in enabling other actors to carry out their protection tasks. They often create a safe and secure environment which allows other actors to deliver important humanitarian assistance. However, close coordination can give rise to tensions given that humanitarian actors sometimes feel that perceptions of their neutrality might be compromised by close affiliation with the mission's military component. Very often, what puts people's lives at stake and very often at high risk is the lack of things like medication, food. After the war, most people are starving. There are no hospitals. Mothers deliver and may die during childbirth. The material needs of people is something the world hasn't quite found a solution to. We work in situations where these actors actually see humanitarian agencies as part of the problem. They see them as uh, aligned in one way or another, either with the government they may be fighting against, or they see them as deliverers of aid, which uh, is a very valuable commodity and can affect the whole balance of power between the governments and, and those who are fighting them. So we become inevitably uh, seen to be party principles of one sort or another. It's extremely important that when we speak of protection, not everybody tries to do the same thing. Yes, there are lessons learned, but let's not all kind of jump to trying to have the same methodology. This will not be to the benefit of the population. To succeed, peacekeepers must understand, plan and manage relationships with the multiple stakeholders in the field as well as making the greatest use of the resources and capabilities at their disposal. Understanding the challenges that missions face, the United Nations has developed guidance on ways to better coordinate the energies of the mission and other UN actors in working with host governments, local communities and humanitarians. It all starts with a thorough understanding of the dangers faced by the civilian population and achieving greater clarity on the role of others in the field. Best practices from the field have all indicated that the most effective way to protect civilians is to make sure that all actions within a peacekeeping operation are being done under a political strategy. And that's very important when you have to maintain the strategic consent of the host state government. Without a strategic framework and without a protection, a mission-wide or comprehensive protection strategy, there's no way that a peacekeeping operation is going to be able to leverage all of those different strengths. Peacekeeping operations have to understand which civilians are vulnerable and why, who is threatening civilians and why, how are they threatening civilians, and what are their capabilities to carry out that threat. To protect civilians, all elements of the mission need to work as a team. This means that planning and coordination are essential under the UN's framework for developing comprehensive POC strategies. The most important part of protecting civilians is that part of providing physical protection in situations where the host state government is not able to. And so I do think that for the future of protection of civilians, we need to really focus on getting that one piece right. Everything related to the restoration of peace and security is useful to POC. Because behind use of force, you have understanding you have also will and you have capacities. It is this combination, to my sense, that is key. And very often that may even just mean presence. There are stories of missions where peacekeepers were vastly outnumbered by the forces on one side and another who were about to attack each other in the town. But the peacekeeping mission simply refused to leave. And having refused to leave, the attack was, was averted. Um, sometimes just simply um, maintaining a presence, preemptively deploying, bringing a spotlight of attention to an issue can mean the difference. The police component has an important role to play in this team approach. 
the police officers actually contribute a lot and can do much more in the protection of civilians because the role and the work of police is to be with the community, to work alongside. At the center of this issue is the importance of the rule of law and a good foundation of justice for development, for sustainable peace to really take hold. And the police have a role to play not only in providing support, but in training and development uh, of, of local police organizations, but also in the, in the broader justice sector as well. It goes back to the root of policing, to serve, to protect, to preserve life. The protection of civilians underpins everything we do. UN civilians working in the mission need to be part of the development of the mission's comprehensive POC strategy. They are key to supporting the peace process and helping to re-establish the rule of law and human security, which is vital if people are to get back to their lives and be free from constant fear and harassment. You need to actually understand the local laws. You need to actually know that we have functional institutions of the criminal justice so that when we are able to arrest people and we take them to the courts, the courts will function as we expected and then when these people are sentenced, the correctional institutions are also ready to accept and then, you know, keep these people in custody. Linking the peacekeeping mission with the other UN agencies and humanitarians and understanding and respecting each other's roles and responsibilities in protection of civilians is key. One of the ways the UN does this is through the cluster system. The cluster system is the system which has been put in place by the United Nations to improve coordination between UN agencies who are involved in helping with the humanitarian effort. The complementarity between actors is an essential component to a good protection response. UNHCR, with its partners, conduct assessments. Uh, which consists of over 60 NGOs, mostly uh, local NGOs, working in the community, reporting to UNHCR and protection cluster. And we share this information with other key interlocutors and sometimes obviously peacekeepers in the expectation that we can seek complementary responses and ensure that planned responses and activities go uh, towards the better protection of persons. Some international humanitarian organizations have limits on the information that can be shared with peacekeepers. For example, the International Committee of the Red Cross. This is mainly to, to develop trust with, with everybody. Uh, in its interaction with, uh, with other actors, ICRC has uh, always some reserve uh, with regard, for example, situation or violations on, on the ground. It's not that we are don't trust peacekeepers, for example, but we need uh, to continue to be seen as independent and, and neutral by all involved. Talking to and building an understanding with the local community will strengthen protection. When peacekeepers come into a particular country, there is an expectation from the community that they will be protected. And communities have incredibly high expectations of peacekeepers, often quite unrealistic expectations. Unless the peacekeepers are able to talk to the communities and explain what they can do and what they can't do, then these unmet expectations can lead to resentment. So that communication is incredibly important for good community relations and for a clarity of what the mission actually can achieve. The first thing is to understand the needs of the host nation, to listen. My father told me I have two ears and one mouth, I should do the math. I think we, as an international community, has to do exactly the same. Thank you.
ya bakaji talk communicate with your civilian colleagues communicate with the NGO family communicate with the local population listen to the village elderly listen to the women in the committees in the villages listen 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 it's nothing worth it have a person who has a radio with only one button on it and then transmit All civilians are vulnerable, but women and children are particularly at risk. Increasingly, women and children have been targeted, and peacekeeping missions need to be prepared to meet the very pressing challenge of violence against women and children. Part of the changing face of war, or the changing nature of conflict, is the increasing use of sexual violence actually is a cheap, effective and silent tool of war, actually literally as a tactic of war. We've long seen sexual violence concomitant with conflict, but seen it as somehow uh, just a byproduct of conflict or part of war's collateral damage. In fact, in contemporary conflicts, we know that sexual violence is used as a means to achieve military, political and economic ends. It's more dangerous to be a woman than a soldier. They cannot say, well, we know that uh, uh, there are uh, armed groups in the, in the forest, uh, so I'll stay home. They have to go out. They are the ones who fetch water and firewood and bring produce to the market and, and make sure that uh, the children are, are taken care of. And this is often when uh, they are attacked. So, for example, peacekeepers have to think on which are the ways, and maybe non-traditional ways, of patrolling. Some of these include the firewood patrols, which have reduced the incidence of rape. Some of these include market escorts tailored to women's mobility patterns, so women can safely get to market and undertake trade, which then supports economic recovery in the post-conflict phase. You cannot not only patrol main roads, you have to go maybe to smaller. You have to think on well-lit uh, latrines or, or showers in the camps. One interesting practice that I actually heard about first when I went to Rwanda and talked to the Rwandan Defence Force. Some of these Rwandan soldiers told me we saw mass rape during the genocide in 1994 in our country. So when we are in Darfur, we look upon those women and girls as our own sisters, mothers and aunties, and we do for them as we would want to do for the women in our own country. So they worked with the women in the camps to build these fuel-efficient stoves, which used less fuel and enabled women to actually have to venture out of the camp less at great personal risk um, and to be able to still cook the same amount of food. Sometimes people forget uh, because they're thinking about the services that people need. People need food, they need water, they need sanitation, and they forget that there are big issues uh, for people in terms of the violence uh, that they have encountered, the abuse that they've encountered, all of which has a huge impact on them uh, psychologically. We must recognize that this is a very sensitive area, that women may not want to speak about that. that they may feel shamed by that, and we have to be sensitive to these concerns and, and recognize that our approaches must change. So, for example, bringing far more women into peacekeeping in some fashion or another is absolutely critical when we deal with the protection issues. I remember I visited a, a little hamlet where the night before, 47 women and girls were gang raped and locked up in their huts and burned alive. And the perpetrators fled. And then the men came back to the village and told us, we know where they are. We know where they're hiding in the bush. So what are you going to do? Today it is an, an internationally recognized crime and this is how we have to fight it. It is not cultural, it is not even sexual, it is criminal. There's no question that the protection of, of civilians and in particular I would argue children is, is crucial to ensuring that we have a secure future. And let's just take the example of child soldiers where you have a, a, a 10 or a 12 or a 14 year old who's been enslaved in an army camp, uh, reintegrating them into a community that one, may not want them back, two, they may never have been integrated to begin with, and three, they may no longer be a child. 
One of the things that young people themselves have told us uh, who have formed a group of former child soldiers is they want to be trained for lucrative livelihood that will prevent them from ever being recruited back into armed forces again. We have international legal frameworks that govern this work. We have the Convention on the Rights of the Child, we have Geneva Conventions, we have Paris Principles, we have the Optional Protocol on the Sale of Children, and we have resolutions of the Security Council. So we've moved a long way in the last, I would say, seven years. We know what's right and wrong. Actors know what is right and wrong in these contexts. It's not an optional part of our work, in our opinion. It's really one that we are morally and normatively uh, responsible for. The UN has begun to develop new thinking about the protection of civilians on the basis of lessons learnt during peacekeeping operations. Material has been developed over the last few years that has clarified what it means for peacekeeping missions to protect civilians. However, more needs to be done to develop the UN's capacity to protect civilians and to better direct peacekeeping operations towards that objective. Has the world learned how to protect civilians in the face of this entirely new ideological warfare that is targeting civilians? No. It needs political creativity, thoughtfulness, and practical ways of protecting civilians. Peacekeepers are faced with tough decisions when it comes to the protection of civilians, and they need clarity regarding their roles and responsibilities in the field. Training based on lessons learnt is now being rolled out to support peacekeepers, both pre-deployment and in mission. This training helps build a shared understanding of protection. I guess it really comes to ensuring that all people engaged in providing assistance in, a, in an emergency situation have a shared understanding of um, the concept of protection of civilians and understanding their role in it. So I think we go back to the issue of training. Risky, because soldiers will always behave on the ground the way they have been trained. There's general training, but there's very also very specific mission training, because a mission in Darfur, or a mission in Liberia, or a mission in Haiti is different from a mission in Congo. In addition to training, many innovative practices have developed over the last decade. Some successes have been achieved through the willingness of peacekeepers to do their utmost. There are so many horror stories, and the horror stories really make the headlines. But it's important to also be attuned to some of the success stories, albeit modest. Some of these success stories really show that protection and prevention is possible. Protection really is dependent entirely on the situation on the ground. The type of protection work that you're doing in, in Darfur is different to the type of protection work that you're doing in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, and is again different to the protection work that you're doing in Somalia. If you look, for example, at the protection work that was done by our mission in Darfur, it was only through an understanding of the seasonal migration routes that our forces were able to provide the right type of protection at the right time. We were not expanding resources protecting routes during the non-migration seasons. But we were able then to assist during the migration seasons. So it's, it's that type of innovation which is key and which is entirely context dependent. When POC is in play, the question we should ask is, yes, we are, they are protected because we are here. What will happen when we leave? The UN one day will fold its umbrella and get out of the country, and the protection of civilians would have to continue. It is the responsibility of the host state to provide protection for its citizens. The last decade has seen a clear improvement in the tools available for the implementation of protection of civilian mandates. Tools have included development of training materials and frameworks to guide missions in the development of comprehensive mission strategies. But more needs to be done to address the challenges that lie ahead. Peacekeepers and other UN actors on the ground have demonstrated their determination to develop new and innovative practices to respond to these challenges.
if you look at peacekeeping globally, it's been proven to be a remarkably flexible tool and a tool which, when deployed, has really helped countries to make that transition from the end of conflict to the beginning of peace. Uh, to allowing them to make the transition to uh, a stable government and to put in, in check the armed forces, uh, disarm militias, create a sense of confidence in the peace that has allowed economies to kickstart. I think, you know, sometimes we get fixated on the resolutions from the Security Council, the reports, the meetings, the conferences, but obviously the real measure of success is that civilians feel safer in their day-to-day -day lives. We don't just measure conflict in conventional hard security terms of bullets, bombs and blades, but we actually measure it in terms of a, whether a woman can safely get to the market or whether a girl can safely get to school. Whether civilians can go about their daily lives with a sense of security, that has to be our ultimate measure of success. I cannot say more than what we have has already been said on protection of civilians. Now it's time to stop talking and go for the action. And the action is on the ground, not in the offices, not in the buildings. Let's go for the action and find solutions because there are solutions. Conflict for anybody is not good. Uh, it results in people not being able to achieve their aspirations, lives being cut short and a whole lot of misery. Civilian population is what defence forces exist for, uh, to protect their way of life, to protect their freedoms, to protect their right to be able to speak out and, and practice and do what they want to do. Every time the population encounter a man with a weapon, they know that they are going to be in trouble. But if this man is wearing a blue helmet, they know that they are going to be in a safe haven. And peace without the safety and protection of civilians cannot be complete peace.